Okay, this is uh, lecture number five for Friday, May 1st for History 320 on the French Revolution at Northland College. Um, it was, I was talking last time about the Ancien Regime, and I talked about various groups from the peasants to the bourgeoisie um, to the urban working poor. Um, today I want to talk about the last two groups who were really at the top of society uh, in a lot of ways, um, the aristocracy and the clergy. And the one of the things to understand is that even amongst these groups where the, the, the elites of society certainly came from the aristocracy and the clergy, but being a member of the aristocracy and the clergy did not mean one was elite necessarily. There were lots of poor clergy, there were lots of poor aristocrats. So let's talk about the different gradations. And, and, and again, keep in mind that these are, these are being treated as social classes by the Marxists. They see this group as, as the upper class of society. Um, so the aristocracy. Um, er, er, the aristocracy was defined legally. If you ha legally had a title, you were an aristocrat, you were a noble, okay? And that put, that gave you a whole bunch of privileges that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but, it, uh, but the, the, the key thing about the nobility is that they, their title was their claim to elite status, and the title was passed down from father to son, and it was passed down through primogeniture, which means that the eldest son always got the title. And in fact, under French law, the eldest son not only got the title, the eldest son got all of the land that the family owned. And they did that because they didn't want to have each generation have less and less land, and then they wound up being poor. So they thought it was better to have all the land kept together and attached to one title, and the, the eldest son gets that. Now, the average aristocrat family, given the fact that, you know, 50% of children before the modern age died of childhood diseases by the age of five, you needed to have multiple sons. And so the aristocracy produced lots of children. And, and essentially, you know, you had the heir and you had the spares. And, but what do you do with the younger sons? Now, the younger sons have to be trained as if they're going to be aristocrats. If the, a duke has five sons, he's got to train all of them as if they're going to be the next duke because he doesn't know how many of them are going to die. And so um, each son is trained as if he's going to be the duke or he's going to be a count or a viscount or whatever. But when the eldest son inherits that title and becomes duke and then has a son himself, the other brothers are essentially uh, superfluous. They, they don't matter anymore. And so families often had to find out ways to take care of those younger sons, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those in a little bit, but um, because when we get to the church, that's where a lot of the younger sons wound up. But a lot of these younger sons often had to try to use family connections, marriages, um, things like that, to try to generate their own noble line and, and come up with a way of, of acquiring land and estates. Um, and a lot of younger sons didn't manage to do this, okay? So, when you look at noble families, some of the noble families in France could trace their lineage back to the Middle Ages. Um, it was not uncommon in the Middle Ages, after a big battle or a conquest, for a king to, to ennoble a whole bunch of the soldiers who had done great things in the battle. And so, this was like, considered the best way to get a noble title, was to accomplish some great thing in battle and get a noble title and pass that down to all your future generations. The group that did that, and, and so basically if somebody could trace their lineage back to the Middle Ages, they generally, it was generally assumed that they had had an ancestor who had done something really amazing in war. Um, and so this group was called the Nobility of the Sword. And these old families were very proud of being old families. They were very proud of being noble all the way back, so to speak, and, and there was a huge industry about um, coming up with genealogies to show exactly how you, your title passed through the generations. Um, and, but there were, there were other ways you could become noble, and one of the ways was that you could, uh, the, there were certain government positions, minister of this or a minister of that, that carried a noble title with them. So if you took that position, you you got a noble title. Now, some of those noble titles were only for you; they weren't they weren't passed on to your children. But some of the noble titles from offices were passed on to your children and became permanent noble titles. And so 
this was a second way you could become noble, and not through warfare, but by being appointed as a minister of something or as a high-ranking government official and getting a noble title with the office. And these, this, this group was called the nobility of the robe because they obviously spent their time in office you know, pushing paperwork around, and they, and they generally wore fancy robes. Um, so there were two groups of nobles, and they, they generally the nobility of the sword saw the nobility of the robe as a bunch of newcomers and, and you know, neophytes, and they're not real aristocrats, etc. And the nobility of the robe saw themselves as sort of an, a meritocratic elite. They got their positions because they were really smart and good at what they did, and they got the noble title because of that, and they saw the nobility of the sword as a bunch of old, uh, you know, stupid old warriors who were living off of their great 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 grandparents' glory. Um, and there was so there's a certain certain amount of animosity between the nobility of the sword and the robe. And, but of course, you know, people would marry across that divide, etc. But but there was a certain snobbishness on each side toward the other. All right, the. Um, One other aspect of this that I should point out is that in the 18th century, we talked, I talked before about how the French government was in serious financial difficulties in the 18th century. One of the ways that, you, that the government tried to handle that was it would actually sell offices. And what this had, what we do here is you would say, here's the office of minister of this or that, and you would sell it to the highest bidder, and the highest bidder would pay, you know, the equivalent in today's dollars of millions of dollars for this noble office. And it came with a title, and it came with a lifetime appointment. Well, if you can't fire the person, the person's, and they bought the office just for the title, they're really not going to try to do it very well. And so what you would have to do then is hire somebody else who could actually do the job as the assistant to the minister. And the assistant would not get the noble title, but they would get paid, and they would do all the work. And so the French government generally it was getting kind of bloated because it kept selling offices to make money. But then once it had sold an office, it had to actually pay two salaries the salary for the person that sold the office to, and then the salary of the assistant to actually do the work. Um, and so in the long run, selling offices was not a great financial decision by the governments, but it was a short-term fix, and governments often couldn't, uh, the French government often couldn't resist it. Um, so there's the nobility of the robe and the nobility of the sword, and, and um, they're all potentially elite. But let me talk now about the, the aristocracy and how, how they made their living. Now, there was actually a law in France that an aristocrat could not make a living from his hands, from work. And, and that meant an aristocrat could not practice a trade like shoemaking or candle making or anything. And an aristocrat could not own a factory that produced candles or anything like that. Right? If they did, they could, they could undergo what's called derogation, which is their, ta their, their title was taken away from them. Um, and so really the only acceptable way for an aristocrat to make a living was from land, from the owning estates, because that's what aristocrats were supposed to do. They were supposed to be the lords of big estates. And, and the really wealthy aristocrat families had enormous estates, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres spread out all over France, and they, they brought in millions and millions of, the equivalent of millions and millions of dollars worth of income every year um, from these huge estates, okay, run by, worked by peasants. But... Um, other nobles didn't have a whole lot of land. There were lots and lots of nobles who had a, a title and maybe a small chunk of land, and that was really hard to get by on. And so some nobles turned to, there were a couple of occupations you could do as a noble. One is you could run a mine, because that was seen as an extension of being a landowner and having an estate. And so you could run a mining company, and you could actually manage miners and sell your product, etc. You could also run a lumber company. You could sell wood, right, because owning a forest was seen as an extension of being a landowner. Um, and anything else that you can sort of justify as being an extension of being a landowner, um, you could, you know, selling dried fish or something, you could do as an aristocrat, and some aristocrats did that. But for a lot of them, they really found themselves um, not very well off. And, and there, were, there were actually enormous gradations in, in wealth. Now, Aristocrats got their wealth um, from a couple of sources. One is that they, they had a certain amount of land that they directly owned, and they just made peasants work on it, right? And, uh, or they even rented it out to peasants, and they got income that way. And then they had other land, uh, well, they, they had land they rented out to peasants that peasants worked on, and they sharecropped with the aristocratic lord, 
or they had land called Demence land, which the Lord owned, and he simply made peasants come and work on it, and he kept all the produce from that land. Okay. Um, but nobles also had these other privileges that I talked about last time with peasants, right? That nobles could run a flour mill and, and make money off of their peasants that way, um, milling the peasants' flour. They could run a wine press. Um, they could, uh, you know, they had privileges on, on the amount of fish the, you know, peasants took out of the river or the lake. They had, they had a, a, they got a cut of the wood taken from the forest, etc. So all of those privileges provided income for aristocrats, okay? And because land was the source of it, and some aristocrats had a lot and some didn't, there, was an, there were really very large gradations of wealth amongst aristocrats. Okay. Oh, I should also mention, just I, I forgot, there were a couple other privileges aristocrats had. One is that there was a separate legal system for aristocrats. If you were accused of a crime as an aristocrat, it was a different court system than if you were accused of a crime with, if you weren't an aristocrat. Okay. If you got put on trial for murder or something, you got a jury of other aristocrats. You did not get a jury of commoners, um, and and there was a, there were different legal procedures and different even different courts sometimes that handled aristocratic cases. Also, aristocrats had a number of, of sort of showy privileges. Aristocrats were the only ones who could wear a sword uh, in public. Uh, aristocrats were the only ones. There were certain types of fabric, certain colors of fabric that only aristocrats were allowed to wear. So you could announce you were an aristocrat by wearing this color or type of fabric. Um, there were all sorts of, of kind of minor privileges like that. So, as I mentioned, there were enormous gradations in wealth um, for aristocrats. At the, at, the t at the very top was a group called the Grand, the Great. And, and these families had amassed over centuries enormous estates, as I, I mentioned, hundreds of thousands of acres, uh, maybe even millions of acres. And their incomes were actually absolutely enormous. I mean, in today's terms, they would be hundreds of millions of dollars a year in income. And these families basically spent most of their time orbiting the king, right? Now, by, by the time of the French Revolution, the French uh, uh, system was pretty well set that the king had a number of palaces, the biggest one being Versailles, which is about you know, 12 miles outside of Paris today. It's about 20 miles outside of Paris back then because Paris was smaller. Um, but Versailles is this enormous palace complex. It was built in the mid-18th century. Um, and uh, what would happen is the king would live at Versailles and all the great families, the Grands, would want to be near the king because that was where all the action was. That's where the political power was. That's where the social status came from, etc. So they would actually live at Versailles with the king. Versailles is absolutely enormous. And so these whole families of aristocrats would live at Versailles, but this was fantastically expensive because you had to live at Versailles, you had to put on a display of a certain amount of wealth. And that meant that, I mean, for instance, an aristocratic woman in the grounds could not wear the same outfit twice. She could not be seen wearing the same outfit twice. Um, and so you had to have new outfits made over and over again. And these outfits are thousands, you know, in, in today's terms, thousands of dollars each really elaborate dresses, and, and, and the king would periodically, fairly frequently, have balls and parties and banquets and things, and you had to get special dresses and, and, and outfits made for that, and you had to have a certain number of servants. You had to have you know, lots of servants around, and the servants had to be well-dressed, and you had to have a well-furnished apartment at Versailles, and you had to have carriages, and you know, there were all these ways that you, you had to show off your wealth, and that, that meant staying at Versailles was fantastically expensive, and only the Grands could really afford it. But it also paid off because being at Versailles, you had access to the king. And this is one of the most valuable things that aristocrats had, was that the king could write laws and make laws and change laws, and the king could allocate government money like that. And so if you were an aristocrat and you, for instance, wanted some, a new bridge built on your land so that you could ship your lumber out of your forest better, you, you couldn't get that if you weren't near the king. He wouldn't allocate the money for that, but if you could get near the king or get, you know, you could get that allocated. And so it was really very lucrative to be near the king also. So the, the Grands were sort of really influential because they could influence the king, they could get his ear, they could get him to do things. Um, but it cost them enormous amounts of money to do this, right? So that's the top class, the Grands, and this is a really small class. And I, I want to reiterate, I said this last time, but... Aristocrats are, are about 1% of the population, maybe 1.5%. It depends part, partly, the, the, the uncertainty there is partly because we don't know how many people actually were aristocrats. 
Um, and the other, I mean, we don't know how many aristocrats there were, but we also don't, it depends on how you count aristocrats, because there were some people who, who had titles that were sort of in a gray area, were they noble or not, right? So, um, the grounds were at the top, right? And, and this is really just a couple, you know, several hundred aristocrats who were the, the real grounds, okay? Then below that, there is the provincial or parliamentary nobles. And I want to point out, I, I'm going to use the word parliament a, a, a fair amount in this class, because the, the, in the French system, there were a series of regional courts called parlement, and it's not spelled the same as parliament in English. In English, it's P-A-R-L-I-A-M-E-N-T. Uh, in, in French, it's P-A-R-L-E-M-E-N-T. Um, so these parlements were, were panels of judges sort of like the circuit courts in the United States that would hear appeals cases from lower courts. Um, and, and so often nobles who were not grands but were wealthy and, and important were appointed to parliaments and, as judges. And so uh, the parliament were, parliamentary nobles were the sort of next standard down. And these, these parliamentary nobles were wealthy. They had, you know, big mansions. They had thousands of acres of land, they had, you know, they had servants, they had nice clothes, they had fancy food, but they didn't have the kind of money that would allow them to go live at Versailles with the king, and so they tended to stay on their estates, wherever those estates were, out in the provinces somewhere. Um, and these nobles, uh, create. They, they would sort of have these sort of smaller worlds of, you know, in Provence, there were provincial, you know, nobles from Provence, and, and in Dauphiné, there were the nobles, regional nobles in Dauphiné, and they sort of all knew each other there, and they had sort of a miniature social circuit, et cetera. And they were very wealthy, and they looked, you know, they looked down on everybody below them very, very certainly, but they weren't, that, they weren't the kind of wealth that Les Grands had, okay? And then as you move down the scale of aristocrats, there are some who had several hundred acres, they could make a fairly good living, they weren't, they weren't on a parlement, they weren't there big enough to get appointed to that kind of position, but, but they could make a good living, they had, you know, a couple hundred peasants, uh, you know, on, uh, working for them, they had, they, they lived a life of luxury, but they really couldn't just buy all the clothes they wanted, and they, they had a limited number of horses and a limited number of servants, etc. And then at the bottom, you had a group called the Obero, and this group is kind of interesting, The Obero were essentially impoverished nobles. They had a noble title and they got all the privileges, but they didn't have any land. Or they might own, you know, 40 acres of land is all they have, right? And so, in practical terms, an Obero is just a peasant who owns a bunch of land because he's got a small house, he's got 40, 50, 100 acres of land, he might own, a, a, you know, a, a couple horses and a plow, but he's actually out there do plowing his own field. But he's still a noble. He's got the noble title and he's got the privileges. And so the, one of the jokes was this image of a guy out there plowing his field behind two his oxen and he's got a sword on his side because he wants to show everyone he's a noble. He's got the privilege to carry that sword, but he's really just a peasant. So the Oberol were at the bottom. They technically had a noble title, but they really had no money. And the overall were kind of caught because they couldn't, they couldn't use their land as collateral to buy a loan and then start a business because they'd lose the noble title, right? And so they often were just caught stuck in this in this sort of cycle of poverty because the noble title didn't allow them to do anything to earn more money. But if they tried to do anything to earn more money, they'd lose the noble title, and they didn't want to lose the title, so they sort of stayed in this cycle of poverty. All right, so that's the that's the aristocracy, and and. We'll talk some more about what happens in the Estates Journal, but it is interesting that the, the Obero are often, because their noble title is all they have, the Obero are often way more stick, way bigger sticklers about maintaining their legal rights than the Grands. The Grands know their, their power and influence comes from wealth, and as long as they're rich, the, the privileges of being a noble are kind of, yeah, I could take it or leave it. But the Obero, that's all they have. And so the Obero are also often way more conservative and traditional about wanting to enforce the rights of nobility, etc. And, and so it, it's, it's interesting that when you get into the Estates General at the beginning of the French Revolution, often the most in, intransigent members of the Estates General are the poor nobles who managed to get elected, who really don't want to give an inch to the revolution because they, because 
the, the, their standing as a noble is all they have, and if they start talking about equality, they lose everything, right? Um, okay, so that's the nobility, the aristocracy. The other branch of the same class, and, and Marxists would say these two are the same class, but the other branch is the church, the clergy. Right? The church in France is established, and that's a technical term. It means that the, the, the government of France recognizes the Catholic Church as the official church of France, and the government of France actually has a financial relationship with the church. It gives the church money, uh, it gives the church certain privileges, uh, and so there's, there's very, a very close relationship between the church and the government, and, and so the church is established, it's called. And... That has huge implications for all sorts of things. But basically, if you're going to, and one of the things is, like the aristocracy, the church, the clergy, has their own set of laws that apply to them. They have their own sets of courts. There's canon law, which is church law, and there are canon law courts, which handle church uh, business. Um, and so, to be in the church, a member of the church, to have a position in the church as a priest or a, a monk or a canon or a deacon or whatever, sort of took you out of the rest of society and put you into this special group of the clergy. And of course, as, as I mentioned before, the clergy are one of the estates in the States General. They, they have a third of the representation. Now, the, the actual numbers of clergy in France are even smaller than the aristocracy. It's maybe uh, half a percent of the population, right, um, is in the church. Now, within the church, there are also quite... There's an enormous amount of variation in wealth and power, right? Um, I, the first thing you want to make a difference is, is there, there are two types of clergy. There's, there's what's called secular clergy and regular clergy. And this is actually not what you think it is. You, when you think of clergy, they go, oh, some parish priest, he must be a regular clergy. It's actually not. Regular means a clergy that are under a rule, right? Uh, regulation. Um, and that means monks. So monks and nuns are called regular clergy because they live under a monastic rule, a set of regulations. Um, and so France has monasteries all over. Um, it has tens of thousands of monks who live in those monasteries. And some of the monasteries are really austere and they, they just need bread and water and, you know, etc. They sleep on hard stone floors and, and what have you. But most monasteries by this time are actually fairly comfortable, and for reasons I'll get into in a minute. Um, but, so these monasteries often own significant chunks of land, because nobles will donate land to monasteries, and then the monasteries keep that forever, because the monastery doesn't die. And they would hire peasants to, you know, work on the land, or they would lease the land to peasants. Um, and, and monasteries were often noble lords to let piece of land. If, if they were given a piece of land, they were given seigneurial rights, so they got all the dues. The monastery gets all the dues from the, from the seigneurial rights on that land. Um, the other half is secular clergy, and this is, this is a technical church term for clergy who deal with the public. So parish priests, bishops, archbishops, etc., are secular clergy. Okay? Um, so one of the things to keep in mind is that the church has a very symbiotic relationship with the aristocracy. I mentioned before that you know the aristocracy has primogeniture, which means that the oldest son gets everything, and often and they have to have these younger sons, and often those younger sons or younger daughters become sort of a burden. The family doesn't know what to do with them. Well, one of the ways you can do that is you can park them in the church. All right? And you do that in, in one of two ways. One is if you have a, a daughter in particular who, who you don't think you can marry off, if she has some physical deformity or, or mental disability or, or whatever, where you just don't think you can marry her off, or maybe you just don't have the dowry money to marry her off at a good level, what you would do then is you would put her in a convent. And convents were often very... There were certain... Con uh, you know, orders of nuns that were very amenable to aristocratic uh, patrons, and they, so they had very nice monasteries, and you got your own room with, you know, a nice bedding, and etc. And being in a convent was, was not a bad way to make a living. Um, but in order for the convent to take you, your family had to donate a significant chunk of land to the convent, okay? So that's how you would get rid of daughters that you couldn't marry off. The other option is uh, well, you can do the same with sons. You could park them in a monastery. Um, and, and often, 
Um, aristocrat families that even park pe kids in monasteries at age six or eight or something like that. Um, and, and uh, you know, the kid that spent their whole life in the monastery. There's one other way, though, you can park them in the church, and that is that you can buy a bishopric or an archbishopric. And if, the fa if, an, if a bishopric opened, the family could make an enormous donation to the church or pull strings and get their son named to be bishop of something or other or archbishop of something or other. And it was not uncommon to have teenagers or guys in their early 20s named to be bishop of something or other. Okay? And so when we get to the Estates General in 1789, one of the things we'll notice is that the second estate is the aristocracy, the first estate is the clergy, but many of the representatives in the first estate are the younger brothers of aristocratic families who parked their son in the church because the older brother got the title. Right. So given that, there's also a huge range of wealth and poverty in the aristocracy, or in the clergy, rather. Um, in particular, the... Uh, at the bottom, there are parish priests. Parish priests were often just semi-literate. They often knew just enough Latin to mumble their way through the, the service. Um, they really couldn't read Latin much. They, they were in a, some poor peasant village, and they basically were there their entire lives. And they got tithes from the peasants, but the peasants around them were so poor that the tithes were not much. And so the priests were generally poor. And often priests had to have a little bit of land also that they grew their own food and things like that. And so these, uh, in, in really uh, poor country areas, the parish priests were really just peasants. And in fact, what would happen often is that the parish priest, if he started to get a little older, like middle age, well, he would often run a little school, and, and families had a, you know, a child that they didn't need for work on the farm, and they thought he was kind of smart. They'd send him to the parish priest to teach him how to read and write, and the parish priest knew enough to teach reading and writing. And the parish priest would basically at some point say, well, I'm getting a little older. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do this. So he would select one of his students and say, you're going to be the next parish priest. And he would come and live with the priest, and he'd be sort of a servant to the priest at first, but the priest would teach him everything he needed to know to be a priest. And then when he died, his student would be named priest after him. So often the priests really were peasants. Okay? Um, above that, you had in, in bigger villages and, and cities, you had a number of churches that served urban populations. And there, the priest often had a more formal education. Priests there were often middle class. They were from artisanal families. Um, it, was, it was considered a pretty big step, sort of like getting a son or daughter to become a doctor or a lawyer today. Um, to get your son or daughter to become a priest was, was considered a step up in an, in an urban area. And so, you know, some watchmaker or engraver or glove maker or something might convince one of his sons to become a priest um, because that was seen as sort of bringing status to the family, etc. Um, and there were, at big cathedrals in cities, there were a number of positions, deacons and, and canons and things like that, and abbeys, which... Um, w which had, uh, you know, you could make a living doing that. You were often teaching people. Um, you were often running a school or you were helping to run the church, the cathedral, etc. Things like that. There were, there were a lot of clergy who did those sorts of jobs. And they were often middle class. If somebody was really ambitious and smart, they could try to come into the, the priesthood as a middle class, from a middle class background, and rise their way up to become a bishop or archbishop. And that was not unheard of, although it was not the normal way. The normal way was that bishops and archbishops were basically the younger sons of, of aristocratic families who had bought their title and their position. So at the top of the church with the bishops, archbishops, cardinals, you had essentially an elite again. And this was fan these were people who were from families that were wealthy enough to buy them a title. And the position of bishop or archbishop, you had control over a certain amount of land that the church owned, and that allowed you to have a fairly, to live as sort of a provincial noble. Um, and at the very top, some of the archbishops from really wealthy, grand families um, had enough of their own money that they could get to be an archbishop and really live a noble lifestyle. Uh, uh, Cardinal Rohan is a famous example from the 18th century uh, of a noble who was, who was essentially, uh, had become a churchman, but was living a noble, grand lifestyle. Um, he was actually a friend of Marie Antoinette's. Um, so the, the, the clergy also had as much of a set of gradations 
as the aristocracy, and they often had similar sorts of attitudes, right? That the people running the church, the bishops, archbishops, and, and cardinals, had aristocratic attitudes. They came from aristocratic backgrounds. They were raised as aristocrats. They thought in terms of aristocracy. They were wedded to this idea of social hierarchy and, and, uh, and uh, uh, wedded to tradition. Um, and so in many ways, the church winds up being as counter-revolutionary as the aristocracy when the revolution finally comes. So this is our picture then of society. And, and I, again, I want to reiterate that for the Marxists, they think of the upper the, the aristocracy, the upper aristocracy, the grands, the provincial nobles, they think of them as, as the upper class in, in society. And when Lefebvre talks about the aristocracy, that's who he's talking about. He's not talking about Ogro or anyone like that. And, but Lefebvre is also going to lump in bishops and archbishops and cardinals into that upper class category because he sees that they are essentially the same social class. They came from the same background as the aristocrats. And so Lefebvre sees the upper class when he says aristocracy. He's really talking about the upper reaches of the church, cardinals, bishops, archbishops, and bishops. Um, and he's talking about the uh, upper reach of the aristocracy, the grands and the provincial nobles, etc. Um, and he sort of ignores the fact that there are Oberho who are really poor, but they have noble titles, and they're kind of conflicted about the revolution, because in some ways the Oberho are horrified at the idea of getting rid of noble titles and things. On the other hand, they get their economic opportunities open up if, they, if, uh, if the revolution changes things. Um, so, in one sense, the Marxists are absolutely right. The aristocracy and the clergy, the upper clergy, are privileged elites, um, and, they, and they try to stop the revolution. But when you get down a little bit, it starts to get a lot muddier and a lot more chaotic. And the, cl the clear class lines that the Marxists want to draw often don't quite exist when you get into the details, the fine-grained reality of the French Revolution. So that's it for lecture number five for Friday, May 1st.